Welcome to The Fight with Teddy Atlas, presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by the voice of combat sports, author and philanthropist, the great Teddy Atlas. Teddy, how you doing? I'm doing good. I had my athletic greens today. I know good that man. you. Uh, that's how you start your day. Every so day. I'm, I'm ready to go. Uh, condolences to your Boston Celtics, you know, uh, last weekend... We checked off before the Memorial Day weekend. Uh, they had tied it up, you know, after being down 3 nothing, uh, I, th- I felt, you felt, I think everybody, most people felt that the Celtics were, you know, after, after that, it was extraordinary. They're down 3 nothing. They come back, they tie the series. They, they're in position to be the first NBA team in history to come back from three down and then win it in the final game. And they were at home, you know. Uh, I felt, I said it, I think most people, as I said, were in the same belief that the Celtics were going to win it, that all the pressure was on the heat. But you know what, Ken? Congratulations, uh, obviously, we joke with you about condolences to Celtics. They've had plenty of titles. Um, you know, the Heat's had four. but And they're big underdogs. Again, against Denver, the number one seed in the whole NBA. And they tied it up last night. Uh, they tied it up at 1-1. This is quite a gritty team. This is a real fi- team of fighters. Teddy, really they, have three, they have three undrafted players on the team, which is unheard of. You mentioned that Miami had four titles. Three of them were when they basically recruited a super team that basically the guys gave up a ton of bread to play with each other. Dwayne Wade, Chris Bosh, and LeBron James. So to be able to do this now with the, like essentially a ragtag bunch of guys that no one else wanted, at least not wanted to draft yeah, no them. Names. And now they've done it. And Jimmy Butler, I mean, Miami deserves all the credit in the world for an eight seed to come and beat out all the teams that they've beaten they deserve everything that they get well that's the reason i'm bringing it up is because uh, again they're perfect for this show they're 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 just a bunch of fighters no name kids of uh, players they got one maybe superstar and jimmy butler but um just all gritty guys guys with that magical word, character. And their coach is unbelievable. My son told me that that this guy is a special coach. And you know what? He was right. No wonder my son was a special scout, that he could recognize such qualities, such things that are deep. And he recognized that right away about the Miami coach. And I should have realized and remembered when everybody was talking about the pressure being now on Miami Pressure is not necessarily a disadvantage or a negative, but that it's actually an advantage in the right people's hands and minds. It is truly, and you've heard this said, it's truly a privilege, pressure, that you have to gift to be doing something that's significant and special where really people never have that gift of privilege. It's an opportunity now to show the world what you are, but more importantly, to show yourself, to challenge yourself, to see how good one can be. I just wanted to put that message forward because I really believe that they got that message, that that was what it was all about, that their coach put it to them that way. And that's why I say he's a great coach. You know, to the credit of of him, he presented it exactly that way. That, hey, this is not something to be down and devastated about, deflated about, but to be actually happy. <laughs> really, and he presented it that way. It's unusual to see somebody. Usually it's like, oh, yeah, you know, uh, um, this is not the way we planned it. This is negative. This is, well, we got to overcome this. This is something that obviously we was, we didn't expect it. To. No, he presented it as an opportunity now to find out just exactly what we're capable of, you know, as far as the team, what we are, and to seek the truth of what you have so frequently and easily said that you will win and want to win this. Well, now 
you have a chance and an opportunity to show it. We always say, oh, yeah, we're going to win. Oh, we want to win this. Well, guess what? Now that's really going to be tested. And this team, the Miami Heat, had not only the, as I always say, Ken, the non-talent, you know, the neon talents, they had that with Jimmy Butler. But as you said, they had these no-name kids, you know, with the quiet talents, you know, the the talents that I talk about, resiliency, dependability, determination, belief, toughness, care, character, you know. And um, I just thought that it was worth really tying a bow on it and congratulating Miami and reminding all of us that when sometimes we get a little down when you know, when we get behind the eight ball, when things get a little extra difficult, that they're bound to happen, right? That sometimes rather than think of it as a disadvantage, as, oh my goodness, poor me, look at it as, hey, here's a chance for me now to get the best of me, to produce the best of me, to bring out stuff that otherwise wouldn't be brought out in me that didn't have to be brought out before, to find out exactly how good I can be, how far I can dig down and find a way. So I just want to say that. uh, Well, Teddy, let me just add that there must be something in the water in Miami because the Florida Panthers are also in the finals in the NHL. And, you know, obviously they, Miami beat Boston in both series, hockey and football, both sports. And um, you know what's interesting about that um, series in, in Florida? They were the eighth seed, just like Miami Heat. And um, halfway through the season, I think they lost a few games in a row. I forget what the lead up was, but Keith Kachuk, the father of Matthew Kachuk, who's basically like the star, like he, I mean, him and Matt Kachuk and the goalie for my for Florida Panthers are like doing it all. They're doing everything. I think at one point Kachuk had like three overtime game winners in a row. Keith Kachuk, his dad, imagine this. His dad goes on a ra- national radio show and says, yeah, Florida, the problem is they're super soft. The team's never going to win. They're soft. They don't care. <laughs> imagine walking into the room, you're the captain of the team, and someone says, yeah, I heard your dad on the radio calling us all soft. Well, instead of like building resentment and like causing infighting, they obviously rallied the troops. They finished the season strong, and now they're just running through teams in the playoffs, and now they're in tough with the um, Vegas uh, Golden Knights. But they were an eighth seed. They barely made the damn playoffs, and now they like p- beat the Bruins, who arguably were one of the best regular season teams in the history of the sport, and they just dismantled them. They just had no answer yeah. for them. So, But to your point about the pressure is a privilege, I think about that, and I think a lot of people can relate it to different areas of their life. I think about it when I run a race that I feel like incredible pressure. I feel nerves, and then I remind myself – if I was an anonymous guy who was just like mediocre and didn't really care or didn't have any interest, no one would care about my result, including me. So I try to remind myself when I get nervous that if I wasn't nervous, it would mean that it was completely irrelevant to me and everyone else how I do in these races. And I think people can apply that to all areas of their life, whether it's work. I'm sure you get nervous when you go on ESPN to do things now with the UFC. It's like you want to give your best. It would be it would be completely unnatural not to have a little bit well, of nerves. Well, if you didn't, well, you've heard me say, you've been around me to learn this. You, I say, you know, so much, especially in my business, that if you're not nervous, if you don't feel butterflies, anxiety, um, you know, whatever you want to call it. Really, it's all cousins of fear. Yeah, it's all related that's to right. fear. People like to, like that's a taboo word. They're afraid, they avoid that word. You're not doing any favors to people or to yourself if you're just avoiding it because it's there. It's there for a reason. Nature put it there. Whatever you believe in, God, whatever, it doesn't matter. But it was put there for a reason to keep this species called human beings alive. Yep. And and it, it's there to prepare you for emergencies, for difficult situations, to be at your best, whatever it may be, whatever, being on the stage in front of people, me going on TV as Ken Tor, him doing a race, going into a football game, going into a ring, into an octagon, going into a classroom, 
for the first time to to face all these kids that you're in charge of, being a coach of a team, going in front of them, but going in front of a courtroom uh, as you go on trial as a as a lawyer, going into the operating room as a doctor, whatever, whatever it is. It's to prepare, being a mailman, going going to deliver the mail, and there's a mean dog. <laughs> there's a mean dog out there showing its teeth, and you better be alert. You better think. You, you better know what the hell to do. It's there for a reason. It's there to protect you. It's there not to hurt you, not to hinder you, not to destroy you, not to weaken you, as some people think. No, it's there to make sure that you're at your best, that that there's an even flow of adrenaline, proper flow of adrenaline, that there's a readiness, an alertness, a keenness that might not actually be there otherwise, that you are prepared to face whatever it is that life has put in front of you. That fear can motivate you to get prepared. Two weeks from today, I'll be running across the Mongolian desert. And people keep asking me, are you ready to go? And I tell the truth. I'm like, I'm so scared about the things I don't know, sleeping in a tent, carrying all the food, eating freeze-dried food for a week. Who knows what's going to happen to me after that? Who the hell that? wants to run across the <laughs> Mongolian desert? Wait, did I hear that right? <laughs> Sam, you want to run across the Mongolian desert? No. Okay, yeah, for Sam. Okay, for Sam. I'd rather run across the Gobi Desert than than go to Sam's brown belt jujitsu and get my ass kicked every single day by black belts hoping one day to get in there. But if he doesn't do that for 10 years in a row, he ain't in a position to get a black belt. So we all deal with it. What are you running across? Who's chasing you (laughs) that you're going across the Mongolian Desert? Please tell our audience that. Since my own my own uh, insecurities and fears I, literally after i finished the the last of the marathon majors in tokyo i was just kind of thinking over the past for a few weeks like what should i i want to do something next i like testing myself you know it's all for myself i'm not doing it for any other reasons and someone just said in passing like oh my friend scott is doing this race uh called the gobi march across the gobi desert six days 155 miles you race from point a to point b then you have to stop every day you can't just go and finish it's like it's like the tour of france today is 20 tomorrow is 28 miles the next day is 24 then 50 and I don't know why or what spoke to me. I just sent an email to the director of the race and I said, hey, is it too late to get in this race? And she came back, she's like, oh, hey, we, we've heard of you. We, we, we would love to offer you a spot in the race. Come do it. And I just said, okay, knew nothing. I never slept in a sleeping bag. You're, I never slept in a I told you, I told you you're becoming so big. You're becoming a monster. <laughs> and they even know you in Mongolia. The, the, mean, woman, really. the woman's based in, in, in Hong Kong, a British woman, but they, the running community is very small. And in, for the 50 and over crowd, like I've made some noise and people like paying attention. Oh, it's a very great. small, niche yeah. thing. But How now many the people are going to be in this race? How many people are going to be in this race? 200. Wow. 200. What kind of field would it be? Like what kind of runners? What, you know... Really? More no. like uh, more like adventure ultra run, ultra distance runners. Like people because, from the Iron Iron Man type stuff. Yeah, but it's it's people from every all over the world. There's a ton of Russians. There's a ton of Chinese. Uh, there's a, a bunch of guys from uh, United Arab Emirates that are like really good desert runners that that do these long distance races. I've never done anything more than a marathon. And and again to come back to the fear, I heard this just like the first time I heard about the. Ma- Iron Man, and I was like, holy shit, that's crazy. Who could do that? And I just found myself being like, I think I can do this. Give me the number. What's the number? And I was like, wow, I'm, I've never been so scared about any physical challenge. Without a challenge in life, we're just sleepwalking. Exactly. We're just sleepwalking, you know? We're just, really, we're, what are we waiting for? We're waiting for that final stop. I mean, don't that's we want to, don't we want to venture into life and, explore life and and see what life was really meant to be and for us you know to really push those kind of envelopes those kind of buttons to to see just how great life can really be like really i mean we were given this great gift given this great gift i mean it's a gift it's a magical gift you know and we're given it not everyone's given it and we're giving it, and you're healthy on top of it. Oh my God. You know, why not take it to the max? Why not explore it and say, hey, you know, how far was I meant to go? 
how, how you know let me explore this 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 vast wilderness out there of life and see exactly what's out there exactly how far into it i can go that's what i was just telling rob that before you came on i said as scared as i am when i start to get nervous about being uncomfortable getting a blister and knowing you got another hundred miles on this thing i said to rob you know though compared to being in an actual combat or going through hell week for the navy seals i mean come on this is not really when you think about it in that context it's not that hard and i'm physically fit i'm lucky i have all this fitness from the marathon training why not apply it to something else and try to achieve some kind of goal that i didn't even think i could do myself a month ago but now day That's by day great. as i've been chipping away running with this 20 pound pack and by the way, running with this 20 pound pack, my knees, my ankles, everything. And someone wrote on one of the social media things, hey, Ken, you should really reconsider running with a pack. To which I was like, okay, I'm planning on racing six days, uh, a marathon a day. How would you suppose that I get ready for this other than to get experience running with a pack? Like I didn't say it was good for me or healthy. It's a challenge. I'm gonna train accordingly and then I'm gonna show up and win or die trying. And that's it. And and that, like you said, that keeps me motivated, gives me something to work towards in my life. I just don't know without goals and dreams and aspirations. I just kind of, it's easy at this stage of my life to just go through the motions, get fat and comfortable and just be like, eh, I'm not going to do anything today. I'm just going to go watch the kids practice. No, I'm going to go run. Well, some people would say it might be better than taking the garbage out. Uh, <laughs> but it, it, hey, listen, congratulations that you can do it god bless and good luck good Thank luck you. with that we'll all be cheering for you and you know the thing for me also is to fight for the people that can't fight for themselves thank god you can go and you could do this you can you can handle it but th there's people out there willing to fight but there's certain parts of the fight that's unfair and sometimes you need somebody else to kind of step in and that's where our audience comes in you know, I'm going to stick with this mantra. I'm sorry. I wish I didn't have to, but I'm going to stick with it. I know Rob put it up there. I asked him to. We're mad as hell, and we're not going to take it anymore. And we're going to keep banging that, keep banging that the petition's up there. Please sign this petition for the National Commission so we can eradicate some of these awful things that are going on and been going on for too long in boxing where these noble warriors get in the ring they're ready to handle themselves and they do handle themselves you know they they don't ask for nothing but some water proper training a stool in between but what they don't ask for is to be robbed to be robbed of their dreams and their aspirations and their hard work and their blood and their sweat when they've gone in there and done everything they were supposed to do. And then to be robbed by a bunch of pencil pushes. For and there's an example people. every week, Teddy, and we're going to talk about another one today. Well, that's exactly what I'm getting to. And not just another bad decision, but very suspicious behavior by the referee and judges in the cold feature on the zone on the Clarissa Shields card with Ardeo... Holmes versus Toussaint. Toussaint was, I believe, a four to one underdog. Holmes was the house fighter. And as I said, big favorite. And the fight was in Detroit. The fight was in Detroit, and Holmes is a crunk gym um fighter. Yeah, Detroit. I thought that Toussaint was winning. It it was a very inconsistent effort by both. I'm gonna lay it out there for you. The best way I can describe it is that the only time Holmes, the favorite, did anything, he was a tall, lean, you know, lean um, southpaw with, with a good reach, and he looked pretty, you know, kind of like those, you see a cake, I, you've heard me use this analogy, you see a cake coming out of the oven, Ken, and it looks good. It looks good. It looks good, baby. You can't have cake, baby. You're going to the Mojave <laughs> Desert. You can't have any cake. The, but, the Gobi and, Desert. Uh, the Gobi Desert, and then the Mojave will be next. And, <laughs> and, and you'll be looking across all those deserts. Believe me, I know you. You're competitive. And then and you're looking at this cake, and you want to eat it, and then you open it up, and you take a bite, and it's just, oh, it's missing something. It doesn't quite have what it appeared to have. And I think it's fair to say 
that was Holmes a little bit. I'm going to get your input in a minute, uh, your your take on it. But mine was like, it, it should have been a little more than it was when I when I saw him actually performing, or some of the lack of maybe performing or the lack of interest or or some people have different personalities so that's not fair maybe he just puts it off that way but it just looked like the lack of urgency maybe that's fair but the best way i can describe as i said is holmes um the only time holmes did anything was when toussaint did nothing and left him alone which was in spots for sure no doubt about it but when toussaint actually did decide to engage holmes he dominated. He he dominated with the power shots, the more just the more effective telling punches, and and then all of a sudden he would go dormant again. He being Toussaint and allowing Holmes to peck and poke, you know, from that southpaw stance, and that's what he did. He pecked and poked. The Teddy, referee, sometimes, some, sometimes when I see that happen, I almost wonder, and I've asked Regis Prograis about this with Josh Taylor, at times they come off the gas, and I don't even think they're winded. I think that they are so nervous about getting winded, that, winded. They, that they let yeah, off, it's a like, mental. I got to conserve it's a mental, something. It's a mental deficiency. That's what I wanted to ask well, you. Where do you think no, that it comes is. from? Well, whether it's, it's not physical, because he wasn't even taking a breath. Whether it's a lack of confidence, a lack of surety, a lack of what you just touched on, that he might run dry with the gas tank, um, you know, but it's a mental lack. It's not a physical lack. And the referee really looked like he was protecting the house fight at home. Yep, he suddenly took a point away from him for punching on top of the head, but it wasn't anything really damaging at all. It, w- it was barely on top of the head and it was more that it seemed that Holmes actually had leaned forward a little bit and had his glove on top of his head and Toussaint punched at the glove. It's It just seemed to be a very dramatic, a very severe decision by the referee to suddenly take a point away in a close fight. I thought maybe he took the point because he had warned him a bunch of times and it looked, maybe it looked more egregious yeah, than it was because he kind of hammer punched him a little bit. Yeah, I, I just, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong, but he took a point away in a very close, tight fight. It wasn't anything really egregious. I don't care what the look was, right. but it wasn't damaging in I any way. He hit that. the glove. All right, he, he takes the point away. And then... I don't know what round it was, Ken. Maybe you got the exact round. It doesn't really matter, but it was either the seventh or eighth. I thought it was the seventh. But whatever round it was, all of a sudden, they have a a terrible collision of heads. That was in the the eighth. They banged heads. Okay, uh, the eighth. All right, I I was going to say seventh to eighth. They have a collision of heads, and Toussaint gets a bad gash on his forehead. As bad as it gets. Yeah, and it's bleeding pretty good. But... It's not in an area that can cause permanent damage like around the eyes. I, I know that it looks awful and it's not, you know, it's a, it's a slice in your forehead, but it's not around the eyes, thank God. The referee does the right thing. He calls the doctor up to look at it and the doctor lets it go. Then seconds later, the referee stops it again, calls the doctor in. The doctor seems to say again, let it continue. But the referee overrides the doctor and stops it. Now, my first thought to myself, I'm talking to myself, I'm saying, wait a minute, can can he actually do this? Because I thought that at that point, it was the doctor's call. Maybe I'm wrong in that state. You got all these different rules. That's why we need consistent unilateral conform uh, rules across the country everywhere so we know what the freak the rules are and there's consistency <laughs> and the only way we get that is a freaking national command but anyway i i was i thought it was the doctor's call usually the referee leaves it to the doctor but either way the referee took over he stepped in and my first question and that's why we're bringing this up this way was is he saving the house fighter who looked to have a long and still dangerous way to go in those last three rounds, right? Eight, nine, tenth. Those last three rounds uh, in a fight because, as I said, every time Toussaint opened up, Ken, he dominated Holmes. 
and he had him in some trouble against the ropes when the belt seemed to save him a couple times. So they went to the scorecards and for accidental head clash. And the scores, here they are, 77-74, 76-75 for Holmes, and 77-74 for Tucson. So if the referee whose name is Gerard White, who I don't think should work, I I think he should be really, really investigated before he works anymore. But again, that would be if we had a national commission. Um, If he doesn't take that point away, Tucson wins, and if he doesn't inject himself into the fight by stepping in, then perhaps, maybe, Toussaint, the way the flow of the fight was going, Toussaint takes it into his own hands, and he dominates down the stretch, and he might even stop him if he got more consistent instead of breaking up those flows of offense he kept bringing up on, breaking up on himself, you know, Again, why is the referee, why is the referee, you know, doing some of these things? Again, you could say, okay, Teddy was a bad cut. Uh, okay, but the doctor, the doctor's supposed to be the expert. He was going to let it go. Why did the referee, you know, why? And, and why for the house fighter? And, and again, you can't help but ask yourself, Ken, if it was the reverse and it wasn't a house fighter, but it was the other way around. You know, uh, Toussaint, the underdog, the opponent that was in that situation. Would the referee have handled the same way? And and I got to be honest, uh, your first feel is no, because history has shown us no. It doesn't work that way. History, you bring up the point. That time when Tyson Fury was fighting, uh, what was his name? Otto Wallen. Uh, Wallen. And, and my God, Tyson Fury, you talk about cuts. And that One was of near the worst the eye. you've ever seen. And that was near the eye. You told right so any eyelid. of the fans out there going to say, oh, Teddy, you're being irre... No, I'm not. You're being irresponsible. It was a bad cut. Was it around the eyes? And again, look at Fury, the cut he had. That that looked like the Grand Canyon, for, God, for God's sakes. And, and he let that go on. Why? 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 Because he was the house fighter? And because there was no way he was going to let Walgren win a fight? That he had created a cut by a punch, and that that the fight would have been stopped in fury. The you know, the the cash cow, the house fighter, the network fighter, you know, would have would have been uh would have had to take a loss, and 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 put a fly in the ointment of of zillions of dollars to come. No, that wasn't going to happen. There was no way. I said joking around. You put a stick of dynamite in, into that <laughs> and, and blow that. And they still would allow the cut to go on, the fight to go on. As Tony long as Weeks let fury. Badu Jack keep going against Marcus Brown when he had a cut just there as bad, is. if not worse. He went like two or three rounds. Probably worse. Yes. Probably worse. Horrible. So I know what the freak I'm saying here. Probably worse. And like I said, they let it, they let it go on with Fury. Does anyone think... That it was reversed, and that Waldron, uh, what's his name, Walt, um, Otto the, Wallen, the, yeah, Wallen, the heavyweight. He's uh, if 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 he had that cut, does anyone think that the fight wouldn't have been stopped? No, it would I don't have been think stopped the minute the punch landed nice. and split his. I don't eye think open. anyone out there that's been watching boxing and understands what we're talking about is that naive uh, to to believe that. So I, I'm just saying, sign the sign. Look uh, again. This shenanigans, this stuff, it goes on, it continues. It ain't never going to stop. What, Whatever, it ain't going to stop. Sign the petition. Where are the fighters? Wendy, friggin' retweet the link. Let's go, Wendy Toussaint. That's right, You've Wendy been robbed. Toussaint. Let's go. Get the damn, help 100%. us get the thing Ken signed. Is right. Help yourselves. We're trying All to help you. All fighters should want this. Fair judging We're down the We're trying to help you guys. You're right. Uh, you're right. Make some Sign of these it. judges be former fighters. I'm looking at the names of the of the judges that scored this fight um, that we're talking about. Rosemary Gross. I don't know who she is. Cat- Catalia Chambers. Is that a man or a woman? I don't know. And Vincent Santino. I don't remember hearing any of their names ever getting in Only the one of them. Only one of those judges had to score more towards what I would have had it, where they had it in favor of Tucson. 77-74 for Rosemary Gross. 
Who's she who, having for? But who are these people? Like, how do you become she a judge? For? I'm she serious. Had, did she have it for Tucson or for? Yeah, she had it for Tucson, 77, right, she's 74. She's the only one who I... Uh, right, but I want to know, like, what are the judges' qualifications? Do they know anything about boxing or are they just political hacks appointed by, like, someone in authority? What are they, What's Again, their knowledge of boxing? Here's my answer. If there was a national commission, that ref would not be working again. And he's going to work again until he explained why he did what he did. And it would be a national ranking system for all refs and judges. And only the ones with the higher ratings would work. Yeah, just Please like the Super sign Bowl. It. Yeah, sign it. Stop this weekly insanity. Sign it. It's Sign every it week. Before, before Ken wants to go into the Mojave Desert every week to get away from this <laughs> insanity or Mojave Desert or whatever <laughs> desert it is. There's a lot of deserts out there, you know? I've always just started with a simple scoring uh, criteria. At the end of each round, which guy would you rather be? <laughs> and then, if, then have some judge say, no, I'd rather be that guy. You'd rather be that guy? He got hit with like 25 straight shots to the face he, and he landed three. What are you talking about? Listen, Ken, I want to I wanna sidetrack into real quick before we hit the rest of the fights. Our past weekend was Memorial Day. I hope everybody had a safe one. Um, but unfortunately, not everyone did. I didn't want to go here, but I just felt compelled to say something. We keep fighting for the things we're fighting for, but how can we not fight for this? I felt I had to say something and not just pretend it's not there. 16 people were shot and killed over the weekend. Over 80 people were injured in different neighborhoods in this country. What are we doing? I just feel the reason I'm doing this is I, 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 was, I was hesitant to do it at first. But then I said that I feel crazy if I keep yelling about these awful refs and judges in our sport, you know, of boxing, that are killing fighters' careers, and we got people being killed. I, I just said, you know what? We have to stop it. And I don't at least mention, I, I, I mention that people in our, I, just the people in our cities and the neighborhoods are actually just being killed and some of them are the ones doing the killing and it's it's not just careers and dreams that i'm talking about you know on this program we're trying to clean up the sport and help our fight and it's a very important fight but everything is being killed these people's right to get up in the morning to breathe air done gone dead little kids teenagers young adults older adults people human beings it's like we get numb to it i mean what was once thought of as the most cherished and respected thing in the world human life we were just talking about it a minute ago you know how you're blessed to be healthy how you're blessed to be able to make choices or what you're gonna do you're running across the desert magnificent I mean, it's because you have life. You were given that gift. And it ain't worth a piece of bubble gum. I mean, it's just taken, wiped out in seconds without even a thought. Why? Why? For what? For your rep? For power? Revenge? Anger? Money? I mean, what good are all these damn things if we're all dead? Whether you're dead under the ground or dead walking, you're dead. <laughs> you're dead we need to wake up before it's, we can't I'm sorry that but I'm more sorry that it's really true I mean I, I've, I've referred to it I've heard people refer to humanity as a human family and, and I, I believe that it's a human family we are killing our family members. We are allowing our family members to be killed. And if you look at it in that light, in that context, 
Maybe you wake up a little bit. Maybe we all wake up. I'm not blaming it on you or anybody, but all of us. And I, do I know exactly what we... I, I figured out what we could do. We get a petition for a national commission, you know, to clean up the sport for what they're doing to these noble warriors, these fighters that put it all out on the line, put their life on the line uh, for their families, for themselves, for their dreams. And it's just taken away by these cowards, these criminals, if you will. Whether it was real criminal intent or not, it's criminal what they're doing. What they're doing is criminal. But what I'm talking about, my God, I mean, we have to, we have to do something. We have to do, whether it, you go to your councilman, to your congressman, your senator, same way we're doing for boxing, and you, and you just say, stop it. Stop this, inacti- this inaction of, you know, wh- whether we need more educational programs, mentoring, you know, we need more fathers out there raising kids. We responsibility at home, all of that. Okay, I understand circumstances are different for everybody. I get it. I get it. What I don't get is that we're taking these lives and we got to the point where we're taking them, letting them be taken on such a regular basis that it's almost not mentioned. It's almost not mentioned. Yeah, but I feel like we're living in a real world version of the emperor has no clothes. Look at what's happened in some of these major cities like uh, Portland and San Francisco. Like, can no one open their eyes and say, okay, this defund the police and have less police presence is working? It's clearly not. You can't even go into some of these neighborhoods without no, that's the a fear big of part being of it. murdered. Ken, Ken, it's a huge part. But, and but if you say it, you're the bad deeper. guy. But it's even deeper than that. It's, I mean... It's, it's become like life has become insignificant, and and how could life be insignificant? How can the greatest miracle in the world, the greatest gift in the world, become insignificant? How, how, and these and we talk about, I don't care if you're eighty years old and you're being struck down for no reason or you. are the kids that are two years old, three years old. I, it's just, I'm sorry if there's some people out there that didn't want to be taken there. I'm, hey, I'm sorry. We'll get into the boxing now. Um, but again, I, I, felt, I, I felt a responsibility. I felt a guilt to, to be, you know, talking about how we're killing careers, yet I just came off of Memorial Day weekend and I'm seeing everywhere I look that people were killed. Uh, um, anyway, let's go. All right, let's go Let's let's go back to Detroit. Uh, Clarissa Shields in action. She beats the hell out of uh, Maricela Cornejo, last-minute replacement. Uh, our previous opponent got popped for PEDs. <laughs> I love the excuse, though. Said she was rubbing a topical uh, performance enhancer on her dog who just had puppies, and uh, she got some, uh, some contamination. Let me ask you, what do those puppies look like? Do you ever see the movie? Rob, get this up for me. You ever <laughs> see the movie Mask with yeah, of Jim course. Carrey? And remember the mask that gave you great powers and turned yeah. you into like some monster person, like a green person. Yeah. Not a Hulk, but like that in Carrie Bear. And then the dog put it on. Remember the dog put the mm-hmm. mask on? Remember that dog? I wouldn't <laughs> want to run into that dog. He was green. He was big. He was, wow. Well, I mean, as, Clarissa Shields, as Clarissa Shields said, I haven't seen pictures of the dog or the puppies or anything else for that matter. I did just they heard. look like that? Did they, I mean, did, I'd like to know, did the dogs look like, the mask dog, where they came out like all pumped up. I, I don't, I mean, whatever. She wound up fighting who, Ken? Um, Maricela Con- Conejo. Conejo. Who's 16 one, and 5 going in, yeah. right? 16 one-sided, and 5 going one, in. One-sided, just Clarissa Shields unloading. 
Yeah, I mean, huge, huge, huge prohibitive underdog. Um, Caneo, 16 and 5 going in. Fighting in Clarissa Shields' hometown, homecoming fight, just set up to be like, like you would say, can- cannon fodder. Took it on two weeks' notice. Yep. And, you know, I don't think it would have mattered, but it didn't help. Two weeks' notice, it was, as you said, Ken, it was a, yeah, what do you expect it to be? Yes, it was a mismatch. Caneo was game. Totally outclassed and outgunned. Matter of fact, if Shields could punch, she probably would have stopped her with all the right hands that she landed all night long. Let, let me, this is what Shields is. Shields is physically strong, but it doesn't translate into punching power. But what she is, is technically sound, well-rounded, and has very good timing on her shots where she can counter her opponents. She's got a real good boxing IQ in that ring. She can counter her opponent's jab. She can punch inside of shots. Uh, She puts combinations together well, and they're accurate. And she's responsible defensively. The only little flaw, and again, I'm I'm the CAT scan. I'm 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 picking it apart piece by piece where someone else wouldn't even touch on it. But the only little flaw may be that she can arch her shots a little bit, Ken, where the shots, if you're looking at it, they're coming a little bit with this little bit of an arch instead of this sometimes. Just sometimes when she gets into the combinations where there's just a tiny bit of fat instead of straight, but when she wants to throw them straight, man, they're like an arrow, and she did it with the right hand. Uh, As I said, she's accurate. Part of the reason why she's so good technically, and I'm giving all this, you know, all these great accolades, is that she has a very good trainer, John David Jackson. He doesn't get enough credit. Uh, The former junior middleweight champion who was a very smart, technically solid fighter. Um, But finally, this fight, and that's all the time we need for this fight. But we, we covered it. That's it. Frankly, this fight and really that show was not really worth watching. It was a non-competitive main, a spotty cult feature we just talked about where the referee, frankly, stole the show with his shenanigans or whatever, you know, whatever the hell he was doing. Um, (laughs) You know, I think Clarissa would have probably been better off coming on here where more people probably would have seen her because I can't imagine, you know, I'm I'm half, I'm saying it half tongue-in-cheek, but I'm I'm being kind of serious too. I, I can't imagine that uh, other than a, a workout, she got that much out of it. Uh, you know, it was target practice. And I can't imagine too many people were watching that. Uh, I, uh, I don't know exactly what the numbers were, but you agree? I mean, it was... I, I I love Clarissa Shields, the fighter. I mean, the fact that she's willing to get into the octagon and have MMA fights. She's one oh, and she's, one. She is. She's just she's, tough. She's she tough. backs up everything she says. Sometimes she I just had a wish tough life, and I give her credit for tough. what she's made of it. And and I I give her all the credit in the world for what she's made of it. And she's she's the top fighter in, in women's. I mean, she's Katie Taylor's up there. There's we have some good ones, but. Uh, Clarissa is right there at the top, you know, and I've talked about her place in history, you know, right there with Christy Martin, who was the pioneer, you know, uh, and, and, and Layla Ali, uh, Layla Ali, as I always talk about, she was, she was also helped bring eyeballs to the sport, attention to the sport. She was great and she did it in a short window of time. Uh, she, it was pretty extraordinary, quite frankly, what she did in such a short period of time. Clarissa has been at this for a while. I mean, she's a two-time gold medalist. Uh, I caught her first fights uh, in, in the Olympics uh, when she was only 16 years old, if I remember correctly. So, go ahead. I'm sorry. I interrupt. You wanted to make a statement about something about... Uh, with, with her. Oh no! I was just saying I love her. I love her as a fighter. Sometimes I wish she would let the other people call her the greatest instead of always proclaiming herself. Because if she comes at it, I think from a slightly different approach, she wouldn't have to tell you because everyone would know. Katie Taylor stepped up in weight. 
Clarissa Shields stepped into another sport, got into a cage and fought. Like that to me is mind boggling. Like just, you don't have to, like, it's like you meet a kid who's like, I went to Harvard, then I worked at Goldman and he tells you all this in five minutes. I'm like, if you just let that come out in the course of a 10 minute conversation, someone would be like, Jesus, this guy has it all. That's how Clarissa Shields is. Two gold medals, wins every fight, goes to a new sport. And when she lost that fight in in, in the PFL, the passion that she had, the emotions that she showed were just like, that's the kind of person I want to be on my team. She cares about everything. She wants to win to the point where she's devastated when she loses, even though she's a prohibitive underdog going into a new sport. It's just, I think she's awesome as a fighter. I think I, I just wish she would take a different approach with the promotion. I, I think that her, her her accolades speak for themselves. And the other girl that I would mention that I like in uh, female boxing right now is Alicia, Alicia Baumgartner, who is also at the fight, at the Clarissa Shields fight. She's... Uh, Excellent yeah, fighter, beautiful girl. Um, oh, she's yeah, terrific. Sport is, the women's boxing is is looks looks good. There's some really big names. There's some chem- competitive fights out there, and obviously Amanda Serrano. You can't not mention her as well. Um, well, how about the girl that beat uh, Katie Taylor? Cameron, uh, oh in, yeah, in Ireland. Yeah, I mean, she's she's tremendous. Wow, unbelievable. She's undefeated. Yeah. She's yep. and listen for those knuckleheads out there, and I'm not gonna uh, talk about you too long because I love you, but those knuckleheads out there that can't help themselves that say, oh, Teddy, you were knocking Hearn or whatever other promoter. This guy Peterson actually was a promoter, I think, in Ireland. Um, Some of these promoters, you're knocking them for doing just what you ask us to do. And what you talk about is not done enough. The best fighters fighting the best. Competitive matches like the UFC. No, I'm not knocking them for that. I'm, I I love it. I love the competitive fights. I love to go. What I'm talking about and was talking about specifically, you know, sometimes those Q-tips work. They do. If you get that wax out of your ears <laughs> and, you, and you use it properly, not too deep, just enough, you can hear clearer. What I was actually saying was that when you, find, when you develop a, a home place, a home base, where you can bring 20,000, 10,000, 15,000 fans into a place like they're starting to do in Ireland, and they've been doing the last couple of years, a, you know, a renaissance over there with the great history of Irish fighters, where, where the fans, again, are, are revigorated, and they're out, and they're coming out for the local Irish fighters to see. What I'm saying is, in those situations, where you're developing that kind of, again, fan base where you can generate money for the fighter and for other fighters. You can't do that too often in boxing. There's not a lot of places you can do that, that you don't want to damage it by getting your fighter knocked off in the first promotion in those areas, in those places, by putting them in with Godzilla. You, (laughs) You want, put them in a competitive fight. I'm not saying don't. And maybe down the line, make this fight. Fine. But when you put Katie Taylor in over her weight, when she's 35 years old, just came off a tough, tough fight with Serrano that took something out of her. And it did take something out of her. And now you're putting her in with a fighter that fights like Serrano, bigger than Serrano, even stronger than Serrano, and undefeated. And you put her in with her at home where you got all these fans. And, you're, and, and that, that's the home. That's the homecoming. That's the <laughs> homecoming. I mean, God, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Not there. Don't, you know, don't go and destroy what you're building with, with, with the crowds and with the excitement, the enthusiasm the, to, to come and back these fighters locally. Don't, don't do it there. Do it on some other stage if you have to and do it at the appropriate time. But that wasn't the appropriate time to do it. And the same thing with the fighters, what was it, the same week or the week before where you had Tully, the undefeated 16-0 and Irish fighter, and, and he was fighting on a card. Uh, Gary Tully, he was the co-main. He was fighting a Mexican kid, right? Uh, Ortiz, yeah. maybe? And he got knocked down three rounds. So, uh, yeah, uh, destroyed. It wasn't Ortiz. It wasn't Ortiz. But whatever it was, he got, he got destroyed. And he's 16-0. and And again, okay, I like competitive fight. You're right, guys. But 
and you got a big crowd there. He's 16 and 0. He hasn't been in with anyone tough. You put him in with a guy with 47 fights, with like 40 knockouts or whatever the heck he had, 36 knockouts. Uh, a, a, a guy of that experience, of that caliber, of that danger. No, you got to have better matchmaking, better decision making than that. The, he's not ready for that. Again, you're not only destroying the the home crowd that's coming to cheer for these home kids you're not only diminishing that you're diminishing the fighter he ain't ready for that that's where matchmaking has to be at the appropriate time before you get to the godzillas and the king kongs you know and all those those monsters that you're gonna fight later on you you have to know what the freak you're doing in those areas i think it was the promoter for that was i think it was a guy named peterson I wasn't even talking about Hearn. Hearn knows what he's doing. I mean, Hearn, Hearn, <laughs> Hearn knows what he's doing. He's an experienced guy. But, um, and his father was an experienced guy. But um, I'm just saying that uh, even if you know what you're doing, doesn't mean that sometimes your judgment couldn't be maybe tweaked to be better at that moment in specific areas, specific you know, ways. Uh, again, I I know I'm repeating myself, but you got Katie Taylor. You got an audience there. You got a crowd there like that. You know, she just come off a tough fight. You know, she's 35, I think, years old. She's got a lot of miles on the odometer. She's a gold medalist from the Olympics. Uh, she's been fighting a long time. She's great. She's one of the greatest women fighters of all time. Uh, before you step up and wait, in that setting, in that setting, in that setting, maybe you you think about it. That's all. You think about a different strategy, a different opponent. I'm not saying I don't want, I don't want, I'm not going back and being hypocritical or, or, or conflicted for what I, that I want. Compa- I'm not doing that, guys. Uh, where's, where's those Q-tips? Are there Q-tips over there? Sam, no, I, I thought I had Q-tips, Mike. My my daughter must have taken him to clean out my Teddy, grandkids. The name of the fighter that uh, Katie Taylor fought was Chantel Cameron, and the guy who um, the undercard was Gary Cully, and he lost to um, Jose Felix. Felix, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Ken, for tra- tracking that down because no um, that'd be another thing that the uh, cuckoo heads out there be saying. Oh yeah, I'm going to the one. Why I didn't hear you. Huh? <laughs> huh? You didn't get the nerve. What? what? I can't hear you. Uh, <laughs> you didn't get the name right. Uh, uh, okay. All right. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um. So, what do we got? Some UFC stuff. Yep. We got the main Before event we the get UFC. into the UFC. Uh, let's give a quick shout out to our favorite sponsor, Athletic Greens. Go to athleticgreens.com slash atlas to get 10 of these free travel packs with your first purchase, which, by the way, I'll be highlighting and documenting my uh, journey across the Gobi Desert and everything that I take for a week I have to carry. So everything gets a lot of thought. Do I want to carry these extra few ounces over the course of 155 miles? But you can bet your bottom dollar that athletic greens is coming along for the ride i'll have uh, six of these pack travel packets with me um you can't go anywhere without them made from 75 whole food sourced ingredients especially on a journey like this where you're going to be you know i'm only going to be eating freeze-dried food you got to make sure you get your vitamins nutrients minerals that's where athletic greens comes into play it's like an insurance policy for your diet every day make sure you get all the right vitamins minerals nutrients 75 whole food source ingredients you can't go wrong go to athleticgreens.com slash atlas and get 10 of the free travel packs with your first purchase uh athleticgreens.com uh all right let's jump in ufc never disappoints super exciting uh main event kai kara france in against amir albazi the iraqi fighter um great fight I thought it was very competitive. I kind of gave the nod to Cara France. I wasn't scoring it as I went along, but I thought, okay, Cara France won this fight. But no, the refs gave it to, or the judges gave it to um, Abaz, Albazi and uh, very controversial. Do we have to score cards? I'd love to see which rounds they gave to him because yeah, that's what it. it comes down to, what rounds. Because yeah, it was a close him. fight. 
But yeah, I got him. I got the uh, scorecards. Uh, 47, 48 for Cara France. 48, 47. So 48, 47 twice for uh, Albazi, and 48, 47 once for Cara France. Razor thin, you know. Two but but what rounds? What yeah, rounds? I, I gotta. Do they I gotta tell find, you the rounds. They do. Because I that's just the find key. That one. That's the key to figuring this one out, um, Ken. To be quite frank, because the first two it. rounds were were really close. And the and then there were certain rounds that weren't as close. Like the third round, I thought Albazi, no doubt. First two rounds, very close. Al, nothing significant happened in the first two rounds. Albazi, the third round, and I thought then, quite frankly, I'm kind of in your boat. Uh, K. Cara France, I thought, started to separate himself a little in the fourth. And then I thought he closed the show strong and really strong in the fifth. So... I'd love to know what they must have gave the first three rounds. The way I'm looking at it, the only way that they could justify giving that to, and it's a close fight, but they could justify giving that to Albazi and not France would right, be the first three rounds. Tell me if I'm right because I haven't seen them. I'm not playing right. games. So uh, first, uh, the first, first three rounds, I'm gonna guess. I'm gonna guess the ones that gave it to him gave the first three rounds to Albazi. But you tell me. Sal Diamato had the first three rounds for Albazi, the last two for uh, Cara France. And then Mike Bell and Chris Lee had two of the first three rounds for uh, Albazi. They all gave, with the exception of Sal Diamato, they all gave, the two of the three gave the first to um, Cara France. And then the fourth and fifth, two of the three, Mike Bell and Sal Diamato gave uh, fourth and fifth to uh, Cara France. But the one discrepancy was Chris Lee gave um, Car- gave Albazi the fourth round. Yeah, see, I disagree with that. I I, I I know the fifth round, I thought there was no doubt. But the yeah, they fourth all had round the fifth also. round. They all had the fifth round for Car France. But I thought Car France won the first round as well. And uh, Sal Diamato gave it to Albazi, but it was really close. I can't argue with the first round. I, I'll tell you the way I saw it. Um, first of all, the UFC is getting their share of questionable decisions, I guess. Um, because, but this wasn't the worst decision I've watched by any means. But, you know, it wasn't a great Brinks robbery that we see in boxing. You know, there's no banks left in, to rob in boxing. You get more of a surprise, Teddy. I get more surprised in boxing when they get a decision right. Tell me how you feel. Do, do you agree with yeah, that? I, you're right. Yeah, I'm serious. I uh, yeah, unfortunately, uh, I, I know you're serious, and that's too bad because it's true. I, I felt that France had pulled ahead down the stretch uh, after a slow start where there was a lot of close rounds we just talked about, especially the first two. For the most part, it was like a kickboxing contest, although Albazi had the advantage on the mat. They didn't really get there too much. The first two rounds, for me, Ken, were close. Not a lot to separate them with. Cara France was moving, uh, moving around, uh, using his legs to move around, using the entire octagon to keep the physically strong Albazi a little off balance, looking for shots uh, to pot shot, while Albazi was the one applying the pressure, you know, pushing the envelope, trying to land bigger shots uh, and look for, obviously, a takedown opportunity. Neither guy moved their hands that much in the first two rounds. But Albazi did press the fight, so perhaps an edge there while France was being defensive, moving to keep Albazi from getting set the first two rounds. So the way I saw it, using that thinking, I thought they probably split the first two rounds, uh, one each. I also thought that Albazi should have thrown more kicks to the legs. Um, to slow down Cara France's movement because it was so apparent. You had to take air out of the tires. I mean, he was moving around, uh, throw the kicks to the legs. I was surprised he didn't uh, a little more. The third round, for me, was the easiest to score of the early rounds. Albazi finally got the geography I always talk about that he wanted by taking France to the mat and controlling him there and um, actually doing more than controlling him. He came very, very close to getting a submission with a rear naked choke, but miraculously, France survived it, 
escaped it, and then suddenly switched places with Albazi where he had complete control on the mat for the last 30 seconds, but it wasn't long enough to take the round. Albazi won the round. Then the fourth round, obviously there's discrepancy here. You just read the cards. But in the fourth round, for me, Cara France finally started moving his hands. Uh, not just his, you know, moving around on his legs. He started jabbing, setting up shots, putting together combinations in spots, and even scored a takedown in the round. So for me, it was Cara France's round. Then, as I said, the fifth round is where I felt Cara France really, really close to the show. He he really got the motor running. Uh, now, he, he had his motor going putting together combinations, uh, showing. For me, he was looking, showing, and feeling that he had the momentum, and he knew it. And he won the fifth round probably clearer than any other round by either guy in the fight. It kind of was similar, Ken, for me, to Lomachenko Haney, where that was a close fight with a lot of close rounds, and Loma came on later, but the one round that was not close and was clear was the 10th round that Loma dominated. Yet, one judge, who should never be working again, Dave Moretti, somehow gave Haney that round that caused all that controversy. So I thought the fifth round was clearly won by Cara France. So, again, I said it, unless you give the first three rounds to Albazi, which I, you know, I guess you could, you could do it, um, unless you do that. I can't. I can't see how you don't have France winning. Um, but you know, that's that's why it's a close decision because I guess you could give those first three rounds that way, but um, then then obviously, uh, obviously you. If that's the way you see it, but that's the only way I see it. I because I thought the fourth and fifth were for France, and like I said, I split the first. I, I give the third to Albazi. I don't think there was any doubt, and I split the first two. But uh, I, I know there was a little bit of an uproar. But now, I saw after the fight, Israel Adesanya tweeted out he was very pissed I off. Love, and he I, tweeted, love I love it. I love Israel. Him. But I want to say to Izzy. Some people, going to say oh you shouldn't be saying what you're saying but you know what i love his passion i love his loyalty and listen he's with the team he's he's on that team we understand that but i i trust uh, is he that he believed that period because he he's that kind of guy you know I would say this if if he's watching Izzy, please retweet the link to the uh to the petition. Let's get a national commission to at the very least have some standards for the judges. If that judge was a former UFC fighter, I'd say, "Okay, how did you see it?" Okay. Okay, agree to disagree, but at least you'd have some integrity. You just have three random dudes in here. No one knows what their experience, what their background is. They never give a comment. They're affecting guys' lives. They never have to be accountable for this. Like, it's it's madness. But if you were setting up, like, a, 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 a corrupt organization, that's what you want. No accountability. Almost anonymity for the guys who are making these important decisions, and there's there's never any recourse. You can't even get a comment from these guys. Like, hey, here's what I saw. I thought that this guy controlled the action. Uh, you know, like it's just horse. It's 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 terrible. Um, but it happens every single every single week. Next week we'll have something else to talk about. And speaking of next week, we got um, Josh Taylor and Tiafimo Lopez going at it at the theater at Madison Square, and. Uh, Listen, this fight is all set up, too, to be controversial. These guys are very close in um, skill level. It's going to be a high-caliber high, high caliber boxing event, I would imagine. Both guys are incredibly good. Um, I'm really looking forward to this. What do you think here? And I'll, get, I'll pull the lines up. I want to get your initial thoughts, and then we'll talk about who you like in the fight. Um, what are you looking forward to most? It's an intriguing fight. It really is for a lot of reasons. Um, both, you're probably not the reasons you would expect me to say. Both have taken steps back. Uh, there's no doubt about it. They've both taken steps backwards lately. And both probably deserve to lose their last fights. How often 
have we seen that? Yep, where you're going point. into a big fight where both fighters probably lost their last fights, but they got the house treatment. You know, they got the preferential treatment that we talk about. Taylor probably deserved to lose against Catterall and Teofimo versus Martin. They were they were both dropped in these fights where they were prohibitive favorites, but Taylor was actually hurt much worse. Um, lately, they both in these in those fights, they just walked in. No setups, no disguising, you know, what their intentions were. No boxing IQ. Just coming in, Ken, throwing and getting caught coming in. Not what we came to expect of them or we thought we expected of them, of being a higher quality level athlete, performer, fighter than just guys coming in, being game and chucking punches. Tiafino kept getting caught with a southpaw right hook of Martin on his way in. By the way, Taylor is also a southpaw that he'll be fighting. And he'll probably catch him coming in. Taylor will also have that right hook ready to catch Tiafino coming in, just like Martin caught him. If Tiafino just looks to come in cold with no feint or proper jab or science. Teofimo was reaching in a lot in his last fight. Taylor, hey, the criticisms, I'm spreading it out because it's constructive criticism, it's fair, it's right, it's honest. Uh, Taylor was also just walking in, getting nailed with straight left hands from the southpaw Catterall um, to, of course, Teofimo's not a southpaw, so perhaps that's going to save a Taylor it's going to favor Taylor that he's not fighting a southpaw. Uh, Taylor, the way this fight breaks down for me, Taylor has long arms. He should look to control the outside and force or try to get Teofimo to reach in um, to, get, to get him where he can catch him with some counters uh, as he comes forward. Uh, I think Taylor sometimes looks for his left uppercut maybe a little too much. I don't know, but for me, he better be he be he better be looking for some of the other punches too. Uh, that I think he could just catch Tiafimo coming in, like I said, force him on the outside, force him to make mistakes, force him to reach a little bit like he did in his last fight, and if he does that, I think Taylor will be serving himself right. He get a chance to maybe catch him again the way Martin caught him. Teofimo should use feints before coming in. In other words, knock on the front door a little bit before you just come in. Come in the side door. Keep tail off balance so he can't time him coming in. Teofimo, he has to fight a controlled and disciplined fight using a snappy jab um, to set up combinations and not just looking for one big punch. He needs to fight a complete fight as he did and never did again uh, with that level, but as he did, Ken, with Lomachenko. And we thought that we were watching the coming of maybe a great fighter when we saw that, and that it never quite materialized to that next point. Um, he took a step back, but uh, and then he lost, of course, right away to Cambosis. But, uh, and a lot of turmoil in his life. I get it. But still, that doesn't matter. You get in the ring... You got to perform. Nobody cares about that other stuff. That that's the that's the bottom line. Uh, but he if he if it's still in him, he needs to fight a complete fight, disciplined fight, like he did with Lomachenko. But when I was when I was going over this in my mind, I thought to myself that Lomachenko fight seems like a hundred years ago, doesn't it, Ken? Oh yeah. It, it really. It, it, it so if both or either one of them fight in a sloppy, reckless style, you know, just, you know, just moving in, looking for big shots like I've been describing in the last couple of fights. Someone's going to get hurt, or they both might get hurt, but I don't think they will. I really believe that they respect each other's abilities in this fight, and they're going to fight a much tighter, much more button-up fight. I think this is a fight that is really going to come down to who has the better trainer. 
I do I don't talk about this too often, but the trainer is so important, I think, in the preparation. Coming off what they're coming off, what I just described, both of them. So I think it's really gonna be very, very much a matter of their trainers where it's gonna influence them in preparation for this specific fight. Tiafimo's father, of course, has not, you know, really appeared to be exactly Ray Arcello or Eddie Fudge in the corner, um, at least not lately, you know, uh, if, if, you've, if you've heard him lately. And, of course, Taylor has Ben Davidson, who not that long ago was Tyson Fury's life coach, who's now working with, <laughs> I mean, he was. And no, now he's working no, with some of the, uh, he's working with some, only in boxing, only in boxing. There are a lot of people out there that question his credentials. Is he a, is he a good trainer or did he have like great fighters? And same thing could be said for Teofimo's dad. Is Teofimo winning in oh, spite yeah. of the dad? What's, no what's his, what's 100%. his body of work look like away from the sun? Well, you're right. I mean, tight, like I said, uh, Ben Davidson. And who did Ben Davidson develop? That, whatever his name is, it Ben. Whatever. Ben it is, Davidson. Davidson. Yeah, but who else did yeah, he develop he, and take no, from? Like uh, nobody that I know of. He's he just got in, just put into these seats of working with top fighters coming off the Tyson Fury connection, and um, now he's working with like we said, top fighters across the pond. You know. And I wouldn't exactly say that he sounded like Angelo Dundee sometimes either, <laughs> you know, in, in the corner. But having said that, let that be as it may, uh, I think that Taylor is better technically overall, but the way he was badly hurt by Catterall, who's not a puncher, it concerns me. Yes, Tiafimo, I said it. He's been dropped by non-punchers too recently. He was dropped by Cambosis, who's not exactly George Foreman, and by Martin, um, also not, uh, not, a, not a puncher. Uh, but he wasn't hurt as badly as Taylor was. It's actually, as I said, it's an intriguing matchup for me. Um, Whoever's in a better mental place is going to win. They both seem to be struggling outside of the ring with like just craziness and Lopez with the crazy comments. Let me ask you this. Which one of those fighters, let's say the right, the fight is razor thin, or like could go either way. Who do you think the judges, who do you think the promotion wants to win this fight? Has top rank had enough of Teofimo's? crap you know he's fought on uh who do you fight for the zone or trilla he's had fights away from the promoter so that's not going to go over well josh taylor's had his issues outside of the ring who do you think the promotion wants to see win this fight that's a good question ken and i bet your fans probably want to hear me answer it, but that's a good question i'm glad you brought it up if i had to guess it's a guess but it's a calculated guess from knowing the business as long as they have secure contracts with them both, that I don't know what their situation is. But let's say they do. I don't know. But if they do running for a little while, I would say they would want Taylor. That's and what I was going to say too. I'm, I'm I'll with tell you. you why. Maybe they're fed up a little bit with the father, with Tiafimo and all that 100%. stuff. hundred you know, percent. The, That's, the, yep. the great takeover. And his loyalty or lack of loyalty that he already yep. showed. Um and quite frankly, they came out with this name to take over, and they didn't exactly take over, and they hurt themselves in the public, uh, you know, in the public. Court of form, public opinion. The, yeah, yeah, they did. And they're not thought of the way they were coming off that Teofimo fight. And he's not that big takeover star the they Loma thought fight. he was going to be. You mean yeah, off he, the Loma off fight? Off the Loma, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Thank you. He, he's not that big star that they thought he was going to be, you know? So. I think that they probably, everything is business, like the Hyman Roth and the Godfather. Michael, it's not personal, it's business. Everything's business. I think that business, they'll look at it from everything I just said and one other thing. They'll say, you know what? Across the pond, we can make more money That's right. than we can with Taylor. He's got a better reputation you know, over there. He, he has still be undefeated. Teofimo already has one loss um, where... If we build his fights over there, we can make more money with him 
over across the pond than we can here in the United States with a diminished Teofimo, the way they look at it. And so that's a good question. And that, that, uh, that would be the way I think, knowing them, knowing the business, knowing what obviously, uh, you know, what influences their thinking. I would say they probably think that way. I believe that, as you said, they both had their internal problems in those mental areas recently. I believe that Lopez has more athletic ability. I just said that Taylor was better technically. I believe that Lopez has more athletic ability, but his behavior and technique has been so erratic, lately at least, that it has to be considered in the appraisal of this fight. Uh, I initially wanted to pick Taylor, uh, as I said, before you get into the before you get into the pick, do you know what the line is on this fight? This is for the guys at my bookie. Go to mybookie.ag. Use the promo code Atlas for a fifty percent credit on your first deposit. You deposit two thousand, they'll give you another thousand. You'll have three thousand to play with. Um, please gamble responsibly. Go to Athletic, uh, not Athletic Greens. Go to the Athletic Greens as well. But go to mybookie.ag and use the promo code Atlas. Do you know what the line is, Teddy, on this fight? I believe that I do. I believe that Taylor's uh, uh, not a huge favorite, less than two to one, but he's a he's a favorite. He's a yeah. maybe you got to lay one seventy. I don't know somewhere in that neighborhood. close. Yeah, minus one eighty five on Taylor, uh, plus one thirty two on Lopez. That's from my bookie at mybookie.ag. Um, with that being said. What do you think? And I agree with you, by the way. I think that the promoters and I think all the parties involved would rather see Taylor win. I think people are getting sick and tired of the Tiafimo act and and the comments, Teddy, in between fights. And he hurt not himself just- money wise. He can't. He's not creating the uh, the groundswell that you want to create to make money. You know. The thing is, is also when he makes his comments, he's not like a witty like Floyd Mayweather or Conor McGregor where he's saying things that are funny and you can kind of get behind. He's always controversial. He's always using like horrible language. And the shock value is like way over the line. Like, you know, like he, he's not a line stepper. He's a habitual line stepper. Well, always touch over on the one top. Thing. No, because you brought it up. You're right. You brought it up before where he started saying, I think I didn't even know it until you brought it up, um, that he was accusing the ESPN commentators of liking black fighters better and being being more preferential towards black fighters and, and not, not being as preferential towards him. And, you know, and, and he was pissed about it. He was mad about it. He was obviously saying these things. And here's what I feel about that. Obviously, I don't think there's any truth to it. But I'll tell you where it is in his head, where it's coming from. I believe that when he was when he was the guy, you know, when he was the guy that they thought was going to be the takeover and make all this money and all this stuff, and he beat Lomachenko, and and he was you know he was the apple of Bob Arum and and all Bob Arum's cronies, executives, whatever you want to call them, but they're his cronies. Um, they 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 all were kissing his you know what his yep. buttocks That's right? right is that english is that yep. english way of saying it buttocks <laughs> and uh, buttocks over across the pond is that the appropriate way to say it and and they were doing that uh, they were kissing his tush yep and and the commentators were part of it a big part of it and they were over the top all of them they were oh, the greatest thing since you know all that stuff coca-cola sliced bread crumpets across the pond whatever and 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 they and it was some of it was artificial, quite frankly. I mean, it was it was too much. But look, maybe they believed it. I don't think they quite believed it. I think they had the pom poms on and all that stuff. Um, and they were howling for their meals. They were doing what their boss wanted them to do, what the network wanted them to, what the you know what the promoter needed them to do. Make this guy as big as possible, say he's the greatest thing you ever saw and all this stuff. Oh my God, you know, I never saw anything like this. You know, and and then we're gonna we're gonna ride it. Well the ride was short. They didn't expect the ride to be that short. Once the ride became that short and bumpy, 
Well, they came down to earth. They didn't have That's to say That's the key, no. though, is the bumpy. He didn't just they, lose. He's talking crazy and out of pocket all the time. But they, and that no, but puts people happened, on the defensive and don't want to be associated but, with that craziness. But here's what happened. The commentators came back to earth and actually started being a little bit more real, honest, yep. whatever you want to call it, and, and started not knocking them for any reason other than he deserved to be knocked. They started pointing out things that they didn't point out earlier. And they were, you know, before everything was smooth, it was great. They were, but they were a little over the top, and they were giving him all these superlatives. They got him so used to that, you know, like a spoiled kid. We all get, it's human. It's a human trait. It's a human characteristic. It doesn't make Teofimo any different than some other people are, and it doesn't make him bad. He liked being bragged about. He liked having all these things that were beautiful thrown at him. We all do. But then when they were, again, when they were taken away, <laughs> when the toys were taken away, the kid got upset. When, <laughs> when all of a sudden they started saying a little bit more towards realism, you know, where, hey, you know, he hasn't looked good here. Hey, he, this is, uh, he's doing this wrong. Hey, he got dropped here. Hey, he, hey this, uh, we thought he was going to win this fight a little handier than he did. You know, whatever. Uh, when that started happening, in his mind, he couldn't, you know, he got so used to the good stuff, the BS, if you will, quite frankly, some of it, that now he couldn't handle the truth, you know. And and now he's, he started looking at the truth as a knock instead of the truth. As, you know, he couldn't look at it that way. He wasn't able to. Instead of, hey, this is a... This is just something I need to look at. I need to take inventory over for my own career, my own sake. He he started saying, "Oh no, they're knocking me because you know, in his mind, whatever they they don't like Latin fighters. They don't like whatever, which of course is not true. It's absurd, but uh, that's where his mind was. That was again. I got to throw a movie in there. Ken, may I? Do you mind if I throw yeah, a movie in there? Uh, Tom Cruise, Jack Nicholson. Um, a few good men. Uh, a few good men. What a great movie. What a scene. Rob, if you can get it up there, the fans will love it. What a scene. What do you want? And they remember Jack yep. Nicholson says to him in court of in court to the lawyer Tom Cruise. What do you want? What do you want? He says, I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. You can't handle the truth. Well, Sometimes the truth is hard to handle, especially when you were given all the other stuff. You know, if you were given small doses of the truth along the way, maybe you could handle the truth better. Really? Maybe. But when you're giving him just that stuff, you know, and you're just you're just shining his hiney, <laughs> you're just polishing that hiney the way that you polish your Ferraris, you know? Uh, when you're doing that and you're putting that wax on that little hiney and you're shining it up and you're getting it nice and shiny, you know? What do you think? They ain't, they, they want that hiney shined all the time. They, 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 don't, they don't want, you know, they don't want anything taken away from that shine. And, and they started taking something away from that shine. So that's why he got a little crazy. But I think at the end of the day, as I said, whoever's in a better mental place, um, I, I initially wanted to pick Taylor. Um, I did. For all the reasons I laid out, he's better technically. You know, he still hasn't learned how to lose. Um, and he's more buttoned up. As I said, you know, from from a from a standpoint of technique, and he's naturally the bigger guy, and he has the power, just like Tiafimo, but he has the power to to be much, to do much more damage than Martin did. But after seeing Taylor so badly hurt by Catterall, and knowing that Lopez can be explosive, I said it before. I think he's athletically more gifted than Taylor. And knowing that he can be explosive at times, I'm probably going to go with Teofimo. Uh, and like I said, it's very interesting. And I'll put one caveat on that. And it's what you brought up, Ken. 
and I'm glad you brought it up. If it goes to the scorecards, unless Tiafimo has dropped them 42 times, <laughs> if it goes... <laughs> I don't but, think any of that matters, Teddy. But, Honest but, to God, but, if but, a fight no, goes well, to a decision, times. the guy right, they want to win times. is getting right, that decision. <laughs> All right, 83 times. <laughs> so unless that happens, if it goes to the scorecards, if I was Tiafimo, I'd be a little concerned. But having said that... Um, I wouldn't bet with your money, Ken, <laughs> on this one, um, you know, and and um, much less my own money. But I think I think it should be a very interesting watch. And I think that the breakdown we just gave, really, without trying to pat ourselves on the back, but I will. I think it was as comprehensive and thorough as you can get. Yeah, uh, no, I, I agree. I, you know, well, I know we didn't do a fight plan for this one, but I think. That serves as a fight plan, you know, without the visual aspects of it, as as well as you could get, as good as yeah. you could get. And by the way, one of the things that Lopez said recently that he took a lot of heat for was that he says he wants to literally kill Josh Taylor in the ring to send a message to future opponents. And just like, yeah, you, we, we get all you the hype. And, like yeah, that. exactly. There's just things that you just But that's where say. you need the right people around you, Ken. He ain't really? gonna get it though. He ain't gonna get but it. But no, no. I, well, obviously, he, apparently, no. It's too late. The, <laughs> the 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 horse is out of the barn. I get it. I get it. But I'm just saying the ship has sailed on that. But that's that's the unfortunate part that he don't have 100%. those people around him. It's sad. And, and you know, it's a funny thing. He's got a good manager, but you know, the father, of course, is front and center in this. So I guess you know it doesn't matter. But he he's got a he's got a manager who I know is a decent man, you know who uh, who cares about you know I'm talking about Tia Fimo who cares about the those aspects of it, um, but you know at the end of the day, uh, if you're not front and center, if you're not in position to really have the attention of the fighter in that kind of way, uh, there's there's only so much that you can influence you know um yeah of course well we'll be back uh we'll be back obviously next week with a full breakdown of that fight as well as the um there's a ufc pay-per-view card on uh, next saturday from vancouver canada uh amanda nunez and irene aldana um not the most exciting pay-per-view card we've seen but still there's a few good matches out there charles Oliveira and benny derouche uh Cole oh that's Maine. good that's, That's a real a good, good fight, yeah. And Amanda Nunes, who who doesn't want to see, you know, you talk about goats. Um, she's she's up there. You know. Yeah, hundred percent. Those fights alone will be great fights. Um, and then of course they've got the usual potpourri of uh, unbelievable talents on the uh, undercard as well. But yeah, that'll be a good one. So we'll have a lot to discuss next week. Uh, but considering how slow the, the manager, week was I just week, thought the name of the manager, Dave. McWalters. Yes. Dave McWalters is the manager of Teofimo that I was, I was, because some people are going to say, Ted, you talked about he's got a good manager. You didn't say his name. <laughs> I figured it would come back to you. I was going to ask you, but then I go, no, no, he'll remember. Give it a second. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's interesting. It's a tough position for a guy like that because you want to manage the guy and you've got a, like an unbelievable talent, but at the same time, you're telling him what to do. And I genuinely believe Tiafimo Lopez is a good kid and wants to do the right thing, but he's kid. got his dad in his ear. He who's is a like, good kid. And my know. son keeps reminding me that. Dad, remember we met him in the parking lot in Las Vegas because he was living in the same complex as my son out there. Yeah. And he said, Dad, remember we met him, he saw you, he pulled over, he got out of the truck, talked to you. And he said, he's a good kid. He said, uh, he really is, but unfortunately. And Teddy was saying, it was funny, my son was just out here for his birthday, his 38th birthday uh, this past week, and he just flew back yesterday. And we miss him already, him and his son and his wife. But um, our grandson, our other grandson, and he um, he said, I remember when he got out of the truck and you were talking and you're talking for about whatever, half hour, whatever we were doing. And I remember before he left, you said to him, Teofimo, you, you need to let people see this side of you more than the other side. That's and right. he actually had an answer. He actually had an educated, you know, an intelligent response to it, even though I would still 
uh, I would still I would still argue with a little bit, but uh, his response was, yeah, but Teddy, I got to sell. I got to sell myself. You know, I got to sell the image. Without the image, we we don't He's quite being as much misled and, and giving bad information. And, and that doesn't that's, sell. That's what I was, and I remember my son said, he goes, Dad, you remember? I said, yeah, I remember. He said, you, he goes, I still remember. You said, you got to let people see this side of Teofimo Lopez. And, you know, because it's a great side. It's yeah. It's an intelligent side. That's it's a right, human I agree. side. It's a, it's a good side. But in his mind, at least in his mind at that time, that's what he said. You know, but I, I got to say. But I think image. he's being influenced badly by the dad who thinks that to be con to be controversial is selling. Like, there's plenty of guys out there like an Alexander How about Usyk. just being good? Yes. How about just being that's good? That's it. I don't know. He's, all, you're a great, he's a great fighter. He doesn't need it. all this other BS. I get the entertainment part, unfortunately. There's a lot of pressure, you know, to be an entertainer, to be a Conor McGregor, if you will, you know, because it worked for him. But but Conor was also great for that period that he was great. Oh, yeah. He was great. He yeah. was great. I mean, he was as good a striker and as good a counterpuncher as you're ever going to see. And did he fight the right guys for his style, for his strengths? Yeah, but those were legendary guys like yeah, Aldo. but you also Gotta, get to have those fights when you bring that kind of talent. You can get to dictate some of that. I, I like the guy. I like Israel Adesanya's style of talking. He sells outside of the ring, and I he's not too. insulting like people. He's an I honest he, you know, he gets yeah, crazy sometimes, he's but honest. he stands behind what he says, and he's honest, and he's not talking like crazy out of pocket. I'm sure someone will allow send me some crazy comment, but I like hey, it. Hey, I like, I like Masvidal too. You know, Masvidal. Yeah, yeah, that's he, a good point. Very right? good point. I mean, he, yeah, I like him a a, a lot, uh, and I love what he had to say in his last fight before before he retired. His last fight that you know he lost. Um, his last fight. Uh, in a tough match, they're always in tough matches. But he lost the decision, but uh, what he said to you know just about being thankful to the UFC, it changed his life, it saved his life, having an opportunity to do what he did, and you know a kid that came from what he came from to to become a millionaire, and and that he was grateful and that he was basically sending a message uh, to everybody out there. To find something that you love, find something you care about, and go after it. Go after it. You know, don't think about what you can't do. Think about what you want to do. And I thought it was a beautiful. I thought it was a beautiful message. Actually, we're due for a conversation with both of those guys. So uh, Jorge Masvidal and Izzy, if you're around next week, love to have you on and catch up and see what's good with you guys. Some of those, those are two examples along with Dustin Poirier. Guys, they can come on anytime and they always have something interesting and intelligent to we say. We love all of them. Yep. Well, with that, Teddy, have a great rest of the week. Have a great yeah, week to too, everyone man. out there. Please subscribe to the show. It helps us massively. Just hit subscribe on the YouTube button, please. And sign that petition. And sign the petition. Let's get some change in place. If nothing else, let's let that petition rattle some cages and at least make them implement some changes. At least get some judging criteria so we know what the hell their qualifications are and who they are. Um, this anonymity thing and the lack of transparency isn't helping anyone. Even if you're in the commission, you should be like, we got to change this. The tide is turning on us. They're starting to get wise to us. But, you know, the same shit happens every week and nothing happens. So I guess that they can't be, uh, they're not easily rattled. They're cool under pressure. But um, with that, thank you everyone for being with us. Please support the sponsors, Athletic Greens. If you're going to bet on the fight, go to my bookie and we'll be back with you next week. Thanks for being with us. Appreciate you, Teddy. Thank you. Have a great weekend.